Ring. Doorkeeper, ring the bell. Chamber will give a warm record. welcome. House will come back to order. House will come back to order. Before I introduce our special guest, we have two other very special guests that I'm honored to introduce. First of all, a, a dear friend of mine for more than 40 years, classmate at the University of Georgia, and now the president of the University of Georgia, Jerry Moorhead. President Moorhead. and the athletic director at Georgia, Josh Brooks. Now, Coach Smart is on a very tight schedule, but I uh, told him, I said, you know, there's not, maybe not many times during my career here as speaker that I'll have the opportunity to introduce the coach of the National Collegiate Football Champions. So y'all sit down, I've got a long, long introduction here. Not really. Um, I'm gonna show a little clock management here, Coach. I like that. Uh, guys, I'm not gonna hold you or the members of the body. First of all, I wanna say that um, everything I know about leadership, I have learned from Coach Smarts halftime lectures in the locker room at football games since he's been at Georgia. Uh, some great learning there. Uh, but out of respect for his schedule, I want to say thank you for taking time out of your incredibly busy schedule to visit with us here today. I want to say thank you for the amazing job that you have done in establishing the University of Georgia is one of the very, very top programs. This year, the top program in the nation. And, for, and we're all Bulldogs now. I'm looking to make sure. Um, and I want to thank you, the team, and the staff for a magical 2021 season that was capped off by Georgia winning the national championship by defeating Nick Saban and Alabama. Which, which leads me to say it is great to be a Georgia Bulldog today. Please welcome Coach Kirby Smart to the podium. Order, order, please, order. Is that how you say that? Can you say order? Is that what you say? Come to order. Come to order? Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, you hit that gavel right there. Sitting right there. Hey, I, it's an honor to be here. Um, it's a privilege to be here. I'm honored to be the University of Georgia head football coach. Um, great pleasure to be that. That's something I've always strived to want to do in my career and we got an opportunity to do it at a great place. But you don't win championships without support and you don't win championships without team effort. And uh, President Moorhead, Josh Brooks have been tremendous support for our, all our athletic programs, have been tremendous support for myself and our program. And the people in this room that support this great state um, attracts a lot of players from all over the country as well as our state. They want to come to the state of Georgia. That's usually a good sign of leadership. The leadership in this room has driven this state for a lot of years. We're trying to do a lot of the same things you're doing over at our place in Athens. And we don't get that without tremendous support. Uh, we started our workouts towards next year. That's why I don't always like events like this, because I want to be focused on next year, not last year. And if you sit too long, that guy over there across the state line will catch up with you. So the, the, the idea is to stay ahead. And the um, big thing for us is looking forward to next year. And that's kind of where we're at. We had 6 a.m. workouts this morning, and our guys are out there grinding as hard as they can. Uh, but we want to keep University of Georgia growing, both academically, athletically, in every facet. And we can't do it without the support of the people in this room. So thank you so much for being here. And go dogs!
house will come back to order. Mr. Clerk, you want to ring the bell a time or two? Let's get some order back here and back to work till Coach Smart comes back next year to celebrate a national championship. Clerk will read the caption to House Bill 1302. House Bill 1302 by Representative Bonner, the 72nd and others to be entitled Act to amend Chapter 7, Title 48 of the Fiscal Code of Georgia Annotator related income taxes so as to provide a one time tax credit for individual taxpayers who file income tax returns for both 2020 and 2021 taxable years. This bill have referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. That committee recommends that this bill do pass by committee substitute. Chair recognizes the governor's floor leader, Representative Bonner, to present the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, celebrate two historic things today not only the national championship from University of Georgia, but now an opportunity to give the taxpayers their money back. Mr. Speaker, today I rise to present House Bill 1302, a key priority in Governor Kemp's legislative agenda this session. House Bill 1302 presents a unique opportunity for our General Assembly to put $1.6 billion back in the pockets of hardworking Georgians. This bill allows qualified taxpayers who filed an individual tax return in 2020 and 2021 to receive, to receive a refund when they file taxes this year. Single filers will receive $250, head of household filers will receive $375, and married couples filing jointly will receive $500. Georgians with a tax liability less than the amounts I just mentioned would receive a refund equal to their 2020 tax liability. This refund would also be subject to set off debt collections such as delinquent child support payments. Qualified taxpayers did not need to take any additional action to receive this refund besides filing of their 2020 and 2021 returns. House Bill 1302 is a fulfillment of our belief that when government takes in more money than it needs, surplus funds should be sent back to the taxpayers. Ultimately, it is our citizens, not our government, who move our state forward and know how to best spend their hard-earned money. Governor Kemp's decision to reopen our economy has already led us to record low unemployment and record high job creation numbers. This refund gives our state another opportunity to lead in the great recovery. With that, Mr. Speaker, I will yield for any questions and ask your favorable consideration for House Bill 1302. Do you yield for questions? I do. Chair recognizes Representative McLaurin to your right for a question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does the gentleman yield? I do. You know, I think you'll hear Democrats say a lot, we're not going to object to putting dollars in the pockets of working people because of some of the reasons you identified. But you also said that uh, when, when the state takes in more money than it needs, that it's important to give it back. Would you agree, after watching the budget hearings, listening to agency after agency talk about how starved their budgets have been historically, how difficult it is to have retention policies in place to keep people, to prevent 90% turnover in some cases. Would you agree with me that currently our government does not have the money it needs to operate at a basic level and that this type of measure is giving away money that actually the government does need to function? I, I don't agree with the premise. Uh, I do believe that we go through a, a budgeting process and we uh, have shown a, a very successful budgeting process over the years. And I would also submit that government would spend every dollar that they take out of the taxpayers' hands. I think it's important that it, it, opportunities that are available to us to return that money, we do that. Well, Jim and Yield, for one final question? Yes. Thank you. I appreciate that. I mean, I guess my question would be, outside of election year politics and the idea that we want to look like we're making a big investment in the public, whether we are or we aren't, I mean, is, is the governor committed to looking seriously at retention issues and agency budgeting issues over the long term to study them so that we can be competitive with the private sector, so that we don't have correctional officers at juvenile facilities leaving because the conditions are that bad? I mean, can we get the commitment from the governor to study this issue and make sure the government does have what it needs? 
I would suggest that, that the governor studies that each and every year. And that's, again, that's why we have a process. We, he hears from all the department heads. We as a legislator, legislature hear from all the department heads and we take their feedback and work with our partners in the Senate to create a budget that makes sense. And I believe that's borne out over the last few years. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With that, Mr. Speaker, I will ask for your favorable consideration to return a historic amount to the taxpayers of Georgia. Gentlemen, has yielded the well. Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. Is there any objection to adopting the committee substitute? The chair hears none. The committee substitute is adopted. Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee, which was favorable to the passage of the bill? The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Shall this bill now pass? All those in favor of the passage of the bill will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no, and the clerk will unlock the machine. What purpose does Representative Dreyer rise? Parliamentary State inquiry. your inquiry. M Mr. Speaker, I just want to clarify that this HB 1302 refunding money to taxpayers looks just like uh, the Biden stimulus plan that was passed in March 2021. Uh, so I appreciate Governor Kemp following that example of leadership. I'm going to show great restraint here and, uh, and, and say if the gentleman believes that to be true, doesn't make it true, but... Uh, <laughs> Chair... Uh, what purpose does Chairman Houston rise? Parliamentary State inquiry. your inquiry. Isn't it not true if these people who are talking about not the people of Georgia not needing extra money, apparently they haven't been to the grocery store or the gas tank and filled the car up? Because isn't it not true we've never seen inflation like this in 40 years? And it's not, it's not our governor's fault. He's trying to help the taxpayers of Georgia. Thank you. Okay, we keep this up. Um, we're going to next go on to trying to solve the Russian-Ukrainian war. Um, have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machine on the passage of House Bill 1302. The ayes are 148, the nays are 18. This bill having received the requisite <coughs> constitutional majority is <coughs> therefore passed. Clerk will read the caption to House Bill 389 was carried over from yesterday's calendar. House Bill 389 by Representative Jones, the 25th being titled an act to amend Chapter 8 of Title 34 of the Official Code of Georgia and Tater relating to employment security so as to change the definition of employment to include services performed by an individual for wages. This bill I refer to the Committee on Industry and Labor. That committee recommends that this bill do pass by committee substitute. Chair recognizes Chairman Todd Jones to present the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Congratulations to the Georgia Bulldogs for those of you who are alums and fans. I say that as respectfully as I can. Um, on HB 389, uh, this is essentially, if there was a title to a bill, it would be, in my mind, it would be the small and medium-sized business bill. Uh, this is a worker classification bill. Uh, providing for in Section 1 a, I think, a much more efficient way to be able to help our small and medium-sized businesses classify between a W-2 and a 1099. Later on in Section 1, we do have a carve-out for the gig economy, primarily on the logistics side and the delivery side and the ride-share side. Finally, in Section 1, what you'll see is we put at the very bottom of all the definitions, if you would read the entire statute, it's about eight pages long, we asked the department to look at all of the attributes in their totality as opposed to looking at one over the other. 
And then finally, in section two, one of the things that we consistently hear from our medium-sized businesses across the state is that there are no real penalties for someone who misclassifies, so we wanted to be able to provide the department with the ability to uh, enact those penalties and, of course, give the department the leeway to be able to waive those penalties if they think that it was something that was done just strictly innocently or maybe it was just a first-time mistake with people who are putting together a business for the first time, and we understand that they might be more focused on their core business versus what's happening in the back office. Uh, at that point, Mr. Speaker, uh, that is the end of my presentation. I would ask for all of you to favorably consider what I call the small and medium-sized business classification bill. Do you yield for questions? I'll yield for a question. Chair recognizes Representative Holly up in the gallery for a question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does the gentleman yield? The gentleman, yes, sir. Sorry, it's the gentleman, excuse me. This mask is kind of funny. <laughs> Um, but uh, do you agree that by passing this measure forward, this is going to make it so that Georgia can at least foster a better business climate to ensure that every business pays its fair share and our Department of Revenue gets its due money? Yes, Representative Holly, and I think we'll hear from further uh, speakers on this bill. Uh, this absolutely creates a level playing field. That's what we want in the state. We want all of our small and medium-sized businesses to understand that we've created the floor of the Rom Roman Coliseum, but we made it level. We didn't basically weigh it to either side. But thank you very much for the question. At this time, Mr. Speaker, I know there's other people who'd like to speak on the bill. I yield the well. Gentleman has yielded the well. Chair recognizes Chairman Petrie to speak to the bill. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, Ladies and gentlemen of the House, I rise today to speak to this measure and to speak in favor of this measure from the perspective of an entrepreneur. And to my good friend, Representative Ridley back there, that, that's a businessman. But uh, my friends, I have spent my entire lifetime as an entrepreneur. It's all I've ever done and I've had the opportunity from starting with myself as the only employee to being a very large employer. And uh, I've had the opportunity to live the American dream, my friends. And, uh, but my first view of entrepreneurship was through my grandfather, my granddaddy, J.L. Petrie, senior, who was the son of a sharecropper and who became a bricklayer. And in, 19, in the 50s sometime, well before I was born, um, he started a little company called J.L. Petrie Masonry Company. And uh, he had nine children. My daddy, the oldest of nine, seven boys, two girls. I was the oldest of the oldest. And all of us learned how to lay brick. I worked with my grandfather through school. And I spent a lot of time with him. And I remember how important it was that he was able to raise nine children. He never employed more than about eight or nine people. But he raised nine children with no help from anybody but his own labor. No support from government because he, had he believed he had lived the American dream, my friends. And I remember my grandmother doing the, doing the books on the kitchen table. She did her payroll, and she was meticulous. And she'd show up on Fridays to, to hand out those checks. And this, is, this was ingrained in me as a young man in high school and college as I worked my way through school as laying brick. And it was powerful to me. Anyway, I went off down the road. Obviously, I didn't want to lay brick in 102 degree weather in August the rest of my life. And I have been able to, to live the American dream. But I tell you all that to say this, my friends. Nobody has more respect for the opportunity and the beauty of free market capitalism to rise everyone up than I think most myself and many of us in this room. But that whole story, I tell you to say this. Nothing so distorts the beauty of free market capitalism than cheating. Nothing. And when we allow employers to misclassify workers, we corrupt the system. Employers that are misclassified workers cheat their employees, yes. But they don't just cheat their employees, they cheat their competitors. They cheat their competitors. They put them at an unfair disadvantage. They also, as was said earlier, they cheat taxpayers and they cheat our state treasury. My friends, 
The opportunity that is created by free market capitalism in this country is so important that we have to make sure that it's fair and that it is on a level playing field. And that, in my opinion, is, about, is just what this bill is about. It's about protecting the integrity of the system to make sure that we keep a free market so that all of those different employers, all of those Georgians out there doing business have an opportunity to succeed on the merits. But what you have today are a lot of folks that are cheating. And uh, that's not good for creating opportunity for our people. My friends, I strongly encourage you to support this bill. And Mr. Speaker, I yield the well. Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. Is there any objection to adopting the committee substitute? The chair hears none. The committee substitute is adopted. Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee, which was favorable to the passage of the bill? The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Shall this bill now pass? All those in favor of the passage of the bill will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no, and the clerk will unlock the machines. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machine. On the passage of House Bill 389, the ayes are 162, the nays are 6. This bill, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed. Clerk will read the caption to House Bill 961. House Bill 961, by representative abstraction of the 104th to be entitled an act to amend code section 511233, the official code of Georgia and Taylor relating to reduction of an apportionment of award or bar of recovery according to the percentage of fault of parties and non-parties. This bill I refer to the committee on judiciary. That committee recommends that this bill do pass. Chair recognizes chairman abstraction to present the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen of the House, I bring to you today House Bill 961. This bill was introduced in response to the Supreme Court of Georgia's opinion in Alston and Bird versus Hatcher Management LLC, which was issued in August of 2021. So the law as interpreted had been for, for several years that if uh, a defendant is sued in a case and a jury apportions damages, determines that uh, the uh, defendants maybe, or even a third party are percentage-wise at fault, that the ultimate uh, amount that's to be paid in the judgment is dependent upon that percentage. And the Supreme Court's interpretation of Georgia law has changed that, where now if only one defendant is sued that defendant shoulders 100% of the cost, even if they had only a smaller percent of the responsibility. So the example I've been given to folks is, if I uh, say I'm at a business owner's uh, store and uh, I'm the victim of a crime, I'm robbed in the parking lot and I sue the business owner and a jury decides that the person who committed the crime against me is 95% at fault but the business is only 5% at fault because maybe there was poor lighting, lack of security, things like that. That business, despite only being 5% responsible, has to pay 100% of the damages due to this interpretation. So we've uh, negotiated a, a resolution to that issue. It's presented here. I wanna thank all the parties who were involved in the negotiations, which really started back in November of last year. And uh, we bring, bring to you today a solution that, to my knowledge, has no opposition right now from, uh, from anyone. There was a letter that was put out on the desk as well. I have a copy of it here, but it had approximately 
55 different organizations, businesses, uh, insurers, uh, chambers of commerce that all express support for the legislation. And I'd ask for your favorable consideration at this time. Mr. Speaker, I'd be happy to answer any questions. You have no questions. I yield the well. Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee, which was favorable to the passage of the bill? The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Shall this bill now pass? All those in favor of the passage of the bill will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no. And the clerk will unlock the machines. What purpose does Representative Walensky rise? Uh, thank you, Speaker. I'd like to invoke the Chokus rule. I'm sorry? Chokus rule, please. Gentleman has that right, and the record will so reflect. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machine. On the passage of House Bill 961, the ayes are 168, the nays are zero. This bill, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed. Clerk will read the caption to House Bill 974. House Bill 974 by Representative Gullet of the 19th and others to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 2 of Title 44. The official go to George Ann Taylor relating to recordation and registration of deeds and other instruments so as to re require electric filing. This bill I refer to the Committee on Judiciary. That committee recommends that this bill do pass by committee substitute. Chair recognizes Representative Gullett to present the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. House Bill. 974 requires that clerks accept e-filing of real estate documents. These are uh, documents like deeds, mortgages, liens, maps, plats, things like that. It also creates a standardized page one um, that includes essential data needed for filing by the clerk. E-filing is more secure, more timely for both the filer and the clerk. It reduces rejected filings by alerting uh, filers to common mistakes made and generally creates efficiencies in the clerk's office. This version of the bill also still allows walk-in filings. That was an agreement and compromise in the Judiciary Committee. And that's all this bill does, Mr. Speaker. I'm happy to answer any questions. You have no questions. I yield the bill. Thank you so much. Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. Is there any objection to adopting the committee substitute? The chair hears none. The committee substitute is adopted. Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee which was favorable to the passage of the bill? The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Shall this bill now pass? All those in favor of the passage of the bill will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no. And the clerk will unlock the machines. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machines. On the passage of House Bill 974, the ayes are 164, the nays are three. This bill, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed. Clerk will read the caption to House Bill 1009. House Bill 1009 by Representative Jones, the 25th, to be entitled an act to amend Title 40 of the official code of George Ann Taylor relating to motor vehicles and traffic so as to authorize the use of personal delivery devices to transport cargo within this state. This bill I refer to the Committee on Motor Vehicles. That committee recommends that this bill do pass by committee substitute. Chair recognizes Chairman Todd Jones to present the bill. 
Good afternoon again, colleagues. Um, this is an exciting bill, HB 1009. This effectively drives Georgia further into the fourth industrial revolution. This is an opportunity for us to take a leadership position in personal delivery devices, also known as robots. And effectively, if you can imagine logistics companies, delivery companies using robots on our sidewalks, our bike paths, being permitted to crosswalks, et cetera, that's what this bill does. It also provides for operator in terms of who can operate, how they can be operated, has a minimum threshold in terms of insurance, and then ultimately has several safety mechanisms built in, including but not limiting to flashing lights, strobes, emitting sounds, et cetera. Uh, I would truly appreciate uh, your favorable consideration of this bill. I think this allows us to really take a step forward in terms of what we're doing, not just with robots, but ultimately with autonomous vehicles and eventually drones. And I would appreciate your favorable consideration. You got a number of questions, a lot. Do you yield? Mr. Speaker, due to the time, I'm gonna yield the well right now. Thank you so much. Gentleman has yielded the well. Chair recognizes the minority leader to speak to the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, before I get started, first I want to say that I am uh, a technology buff. I believe in automation, and I think on the face of this bill, uh, it's a good bill, up to a point. Uh, if you take a look at line... 23, if you have it in front of you, uh, the bill requires an unladen weight of 500 pounds, and then I want you to move to uh, line 95 of a speed no greater than 10 miles per hour when it's on a sidewalk. So 500 pounds, 10 miles an hour. Newton's first law of motion, a body at rest will remain at rest. A body in motion will remain in motion unless it's act upon by an external force. So if I'm at rest, I'm gonna stay at rest. If I'm in motion, I'm gonna stay in motion unless force pushes me up or slows me down. 500 pounds at 10 miles per hour is equivalent to 50 pounds at 100 miles an hour. 50 pounds, 100 miles an hour, has the same force as 500 pounds at 10 miles an hour. That's Newton's second law of motion. Imagine being on a small sidewalk, and I know there's some provisions around how big a sidewalk could be, but in many urban areas, in many rural areas, sometimes you don't have a sidewalk. Sometimes the sidewalks are not quite 48 inches on both sides, they're small. And so I would liken this bill to what I would call the rich and the rest of us. If you live in a great neighborhood, you have great sidewalks, this vehicle can go through, it'll be just fine. Great communities, even sidewalks, no problem. But if you live in some urban areas, some rural areas, it'd be pretty difficult to have this vehicle with the force of 50 pounds moving at 100 miles an hour to get out of the way of that. Automated vehicles in this bill can go as fast as 20 miles per hour in a bike lane, 10 miles per hour on sidewalks. That's just too fast. Too fast. Georgia has the fifth most pedestrian fatalities in the nation despite having the eighth largest population. As a matter of fact, New York had less pedestrian fatalities than Georgia. Georgia is consistently ranked as having among the worst pedestrian infrastructure in the country and now we're gonna introduce an object that has a force moving at 50, uh, at 100 miles an hour, 50 pounds. Let me get into the infrastructure of the bill, but I want y'all to keep that tension in your mind. This bill would allow automated last mile delivery services using unmanned robotic vehicles traveling by sidewalk to deliver packages to individual customers. Further, the bill preempts, it preempts virtually any attempt at local governments by all county and municipal jurisdictions. 
preventing local governments more familiar with their local infrastructure, local control, infrastructure capabilities and needs from providing any additional regulation of automated vehicles on their sidewalks. Now again, automation not bad, particularly in the logistics sector. However, our existing physical infrastructure, sidewalks, roads, are not designed to integrate driverless, personalized last, last mile, not last block, not last three blocks, last mile for many of Georgia residents. The pedestrian infrastructure is already worse for many folk in my community, African American communities, who themselves are more likely to be killed in pedestrian traffic accidents. The, implementation, the implementation of driverless vehicles on sidewalks is likely to impact pedestrians, full stop. If you wanna talk about jobs, the last mile is when many folk uh, you see your UPS driver or your FedEx driver or Amazon will come to your house, deliver your package. It will effectively eliminate some of the job market as this bill comes on. Again, I believe in automation, but we have to think about it holistically. And I would, I would offer, I would posit to many of you that if we start thinking about automation in this way, as, as, as the author of the bill said, the fourth iteration of industrialization, we should think about woven cities and not just piecemealing it through. And woven cities, if you think about woven cities, you can take a look at, y'all can Google it, and take a look at Toyota. They talk about woven cities, a better way to deliver packages within this space. Automation needs to be integrated in a holistic manner, is what I just said. But here's the thing where I think you could actually offer some substitutes, and I would recommend that the author think about this. Require a permit for any company which seeks to use automated delivery. Permit. Limit the number of permits an individual company may possess, like gates at an airport. How many you limit? Limit the number of permits available in the state so as to prevent overcrowding of pedestrian infrastructure. Make sure that these robots can only actually operate on six feet sidewalks in industrial areas. And limit the speed. Limit the speed to three miles an hour if you're on a sidewalk that lowers the force that can impact a person on the sidewalk. Mr. Speaker, I yield the well. I'm gonna vote against this bill because I think it needs a little bit more work. And I would encourage my neighbors and my friends to do the same. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, I yield the well. Gentleman has yielded the well. Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none, the previous question is ordered. Is there any objection to adopting the committee substitute? The chair hears none, the committee substitute is adopted. Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee which was favorable to the passage of the bill? The chair hears none, the report of the committee is agreed to. Shall this bill now pass? All those in favor of the passage of the bill will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no and the clerk will unlock the machines. What purpose does Representative Bonner arise? Parliamentary inquiry. State your inquiry. Mr. Speaker, is it not true that one of the beneficiaries of this bill is a company, is a grocery store called Nourish and Bloom Market located right outside of Trilla Studios, which is described as the first contactless grocery store to open in the South and the first black owned autonomous market of its kind in the world? If the gentleman so states, it sounds like he knows whereof he speaks. Uh, what purpose does Chairman Carpenter arise? Parliamentary inquiry. State your inquiry. Is it not true that every member of this House wants to eat hot food? And if you lower that miles per hour down, then I'm afraid your food will arrive cold. Uh, I'm, I don't think I'm going to try that one. Um, What purpose does um, uh, Representative McLeod rise? Parliamentary inquiry. State your inquiry. I'm, I'm concerned about the um, accident with this particular device and who is responsible for coverage and who buys this. Is it not true? <laughs> If, if the lady so states, 
I'm sure she is concerned about those things. Let's do about one more, and then we're going to move on. What purpose does Chairman Corbett rise? Parliamentary inquiry. State your inquiry. Is it not true that the author of the bill worked closely with ACCG and GMA? We sent this bill back to committee, and they worked on all the issues that was, that was objected to by, by the minority leader. And if you look in Section 3, that gives the local authorities to the ability to enforce uh, rules and regulations in reference to, to your concerns. Thank you. Gentlemen, so states, have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machines. On the passage of House Bill 1009, the ayes are 112, the nays are 53. This bill, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed. Chair, uh, clerk will read the caption to House Bill 1188. House Bill 1188. The representative from the 122nd to be entitled to an act to amend code section 1664 of the official code of Georgia annotated relating to child molestation and aggravated child molestation so as to provide that each act of child molestation shall be charged as a separate offense. This bill, I am referred to the Committee on Judiciary and on Civil. The committee recommends that this bill do pass. Chair recognizes Representative Lott to present the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Colleagues, I rise today to present House Bill 1188. It is unfortunate that we must address the issue of child pornography and child molestation at all. And yet, because there are horrific people committing these heinous crimes, we must. HB 1188 is a top priority for Governor Kemp, as well as our GBI Crimes Against Children unit. It is eight lines that clarifies language and code so that each child pornographic image or material and each area of a child that is sexually touched during child molestation acts will constitute separate offenses. Prior to 2018, this is how these cases had been charged. But in 2018, a Supreme Court judgment on a different matter decided that the word any, currently in code, would mean that no matter the number, only one charge would apply. That Supreme Court decision relating to the word any has since been applied to the way in which we charge those accused of child molestation and child pornography. No matter the number of images, one, 10,000 or more, or the number of body locations sexually molested or penetrated, only one charge could be applied with that new ruling. HB 1188 clarifies language so that this newly created injustice to children is corrected. Without question, each body part or image will now be charged as a separate offense. There's no more heinous crime than those committed against children, and the victims of such horrific crimes are living a life sentence of trauma. Please support HB 1188 so that our prosecutors and our judges may now appropriately apply justice for these victims. I yield for questions, Mr. Speaker. You do not have any questions. Thank you. We have another member that wish to be heard on the bill. The chair recognizes Representative McLaurin to speak to the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll get the surprise out of the way and go ahead and say I'm voting for this bill. But I want to take the opportunity briefly, hopefully, to say that in this type of a conversation, there's only two options on the board, right? Green or red, yes or no. When you're in committee for a bill like this, the mood changes, right? It's not like other bills. You hear the way that people relate to these issues, people who have personal experience prosecuting these horrific cases. And there's a dimension to these cases where every person who touches the case, right, or, or is, is you know, rel related to the case, prosecution, defense, witnesses, victims, Everybody suffers trauma in cases like this. A question I asked in committee was, after hearing you know, prosecutors speak to how traumatic these cases can be, even just to look at, right? I mean, you have to imagine to prosecute these cases, you have to look at some of the images uh, or hear some of the stories. The question I had in committee is, 
what are we doing about the mental health of the pe people who are involved with this system? Because I know that if I had to participate in a case like this, I would not be well. And here's my concern, and this is really the reason I got up here today. Our criminal justice system or criminal legal system is what we do when we have no other options. It's what we do when every other intervention has failed, right? Social, economic, health. And in this type of case in particular, we have no human tools or resources that are adequate to deal with this type of a problem. And so this is one of the most, you know, on point cases in which the criminal legal system's response to something is just, we don't know what to do with this, we just need to throw this person who committed this crime over here and, and throw them away, essentially. Because what this bill does is it makes, it returns to the previous state of the law, but it makes these acts more punishable. It increases the exposure to a point where, you know, imagine 10,000 images or multiple touches you could basically get a life sentence for somebody if you're, the prosecution and the judge both want it, right? It's a way of just saying, if you make this type of a mistake, you know, your life is over. And if we do that, if we make that decision, and I'm telling you I'm joining you in, in voting yes today on this, I just think it requires a, a certain amount of conscience to know that that's what we're doing because we don't have a better alternative in our minds, right? And so I guess all I would ask the House to do in line with requests I've made before is let's think about the, the complex dimensions of a problem like this and let's start with the mental health of the professionals who do this work on the front lines every single day because here's my wager to you. I wager that if we had more than just six or eight or however many appointments that lawyers get for free with the bar to go see a mental health professional, if we had more than that, if we had actual systems in place to provide mental health support to all the professionals in the system and the type of family services we need to prevent this type of thing from happening in the first place. If we did that, we would have more confidence, maybe not supreme confidence, but more confidence that when we drop the hammer at the end of it, that it's proportional to what happened. That we're not just saying, we're throwing our hands up, we don't know what to do with this tragedy, and we're, we're just sort of throwing the person responsible away entirely into broken prisons into the whole system that you know I've come up here a few times to talk about so like I said I'm gonna vote green today but it's it's very hard I think for us to engage with this and we need to embrace that it's difficult and embrace that there's several steps we need to do before we get to this conversation so that we're not traumatizing professionals victims members of the public more than life makes inevitable and with that I thank you mr. speaker and I yield the well Gentlemen, has yielded the well. Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee, which was favorable to the passage of the bill? The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Shall this bill now pass? All those in favor of the passage of the bill will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no, and the clerk will unlock the machines. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machines. On the passage of House Bill 1188, the ayes are 163, the nays are zero. This bill, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed. House Resolution 732 will be postponed until the next legislative day. House Bill 1194, how to respect a representative Crow, will be postponed until the next legislative day. <clears throat> Clerk.
Clerk will read the caption to a group of privileged resolutions. Honoring the life and memory of Charles Charlie Robert Crisp. Honoring the life and memory of Larry F. Dillard Sr. Honoring the life and memory of Rudolph Bullard. Recognizing and commending Deandra L. Brown, head coach of the Griffin High School girls basketball team. Recognizing the 48th anniversary of the Consulate General of Japan in Atlanta. Recognizing and commending the Honors College at Georgia State University on occasion of its 10th anniversary. Congratulating and commending the Georgia Association of Ed Educators on the occasion of its 155th anniversary. Recognizing and commending Denise Summers. Congratulating and commending Dr. Angela Williams for receiving the 2022 Yellow Rose Nikki T. Randall Service Leader Award. Recognizing and commending Norma Hayes for being the 2022 Coetta Citizen of the Year. And commending Dr. Josh Boyd, Newton's High School's 2022 Music Educator of the Year. And congratulating and commending Morgan Jewelers. And for other purposes, that completes the reading of the privilege resolutions. Is there any objection to adopting the privilege resolutions? The chair hears none, and the resolutions are adopted. We're going on now to announcements. If you have signed up for an announcement, please make your way to the front so we can move through these. Chair recognizes Chairman Workheiser for an announcement. Industry and Labor is going to meet, meet tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock at CLOB 406. So 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Thank you. Chair recognizes Representative Nelson for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Women's Caucus will meet upon adjournment. You can pick up your lunch in room 216. We have very important business to discuss, and the meeting will be conducted on Zoom. Thank you. Chair recognizes Chairman Todd Jones and Representative Kennard for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There will be a joint mental health caucus meeting tomorrow at noon in room, this has changed, but room 310, there will be a Zoom option. Thank you. Chair recognizes Chairman Tarvin for an announcement. Insurance Subcommittee on Property and Casualty will meet in CLOB 606 at 1 o'clock. 606 at 1 o'clock. Chairman, uh, Chair recognizes Chairman Watson for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Rural Caucus will meet tomorrow for lunch. Uh, Department of Ag, room 201. Uh, we've got Cornerstone and Augusta University. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair recognizes Chairman Parsons for an announcement. Thank you, Speaker. Energy Utilities and Telecommunications will meet today, 3 p.m. in uh, room 403 uh, upstairs. We have one bill, um, should not be a long meeting. I know there's people that have DOT board uh, elections this afternoon, I think starting about three. We need you up there. If you can be there like five minutes early, I think we can get into the room and we can get out. But we do need, uh, need you there for that three o'clock meeting, 403. Uh, here in the Capitol. Thank you. Chairman rec Chair recognizes Chairman Allen Powell for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The ladies and gentlemen serve on regulated industries. We'll meet at 2 o'clock today. For those of you who have an interest in the medical cannabis bill, that's going to be taken up again today. We've thoroughly vetted that. But for a lot of y'all who continue to ask questions about the, the issues at hand, feel free to come to that meeting, or if you'll call Jan Brown in my office, she will be glad to give you the Zoom so you can listen to that testimony. 
Chair recognizes Chairman Rich for an announcement. The Majority Caucus will meet upon adjournment in room 403 and lunch will be served. Chair recognizes Chairman Hawkins for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Health and Human Services will meet today at 2 o'clock in CLOB 606 and Budget and Fiscal Affairs Oversight will meet tomorrow at 11 o'clock, 403 cap. Chair recognizes Representative Buckner for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Dr. Newton arranged for these to be put on our desk today, and um, I, it's important for you to know that this is a joint effort with Reach Out and Read and Georgia Pediatricians, where children that go to the pediatrician are given age-appropriate books because they you know that that helps brain development in the first three years of life. So take this book and find a child and read it out loud to them today or tomorrow or sometime soon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair recognizes Representative Gullett for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Governmental Affairs Full Committee, we meet tomorrow at 2 o'clock in room 406 of CLOB. Thank you. Chair recognizes Chairman Taylor for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Life and Health Subcommittee of the Insurance Committee will meet today at 1.30 in room 606. Thank you. Chair recognizes Representative Bentley for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and colleagues. It's this time of the year again where the Fort Valley State University has brought to the state capitol our annual goat milk soap. And we have new fragrances this year. We have seaside, bamboo, and mango goat milk soap for all of you in my blue bag back at my desk. So please come by and get some of the goat milk soap so your skin will look just as pretty as mine. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair recognizes Chairman Burchett for an announcement. He wants to get in his order for that soap. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, is it possible that I can get uh, Representative Bentley to do all of my announcements for me? Uh, today I want to recognize uh, the Georgia rail, uh, Railroad Workers. Today is Georgia Railroad Worker at the Capitol. And uh, all, all that they do to serve the state of Georgia and working through the pandemic, uh, I just want to send a shout out to them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair recognizes Chairman Dickey for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Tomorrow at 9 a.m., Agriculture and Consumer Affairs Committee meeting, 46 CLOB. Thank you. Chair recognizes the Majority Leader of the House for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, very important events will occur today as we elect DOT board members for the 1st Congressional District at 2 p.m. in the Senate Chamber and the 3rd Congressional District at 3 p.m. in the Senate Chamber. Those of you involved need to be there and vote because it's very important we elect the right folks to the DOT board. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That completes our announcements. Chair recognizes the Majority Leader for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move to this house stand adjourned until 10 a.m. Thursday, March the 3rd, 2022. The Majority Leader has moved that this house be adjourned until 10 a.m. Thursday. That's Thursday at March 3rd. All those in favor of the announcement will vote aye. aye. Those opposed will vote no. The ayes seem to have it. This house will be adjourned until 10 a.m. Thursday, March 3rd.